so good evening class welcome everyone um it is a thodi barf pa do do ke nahi nahi hoga so i will put on my mic we will try to have a long session today try to finish this topic rflp and dna fingerprinting So these two topics they are quite wide and big so i think most of you have joined now so we can start so oops so basically these markers that we are seeing here are various uh, dna based markers that is your rflp aflp rapd ssrs mas so they all include yours um you know like if you want to look for what do you say um uh drought tolerance gene or salt tolerance gene or herbicide tolerant gene or you want all these genes to be present at one site in your plant so in these cases uh, your various dna based markers they help a lot so you don't have to do a uh, plant breeding for couple of years 5 to 6 years and you can find your answers uh, the traits that you're looking for multiple traits actually 
within few months and they, they have been already found out in many species in many crops still a lot of research is going on and uh, yeah quite quite important so DNA markers so this topic has been divided into molecular markers the basic principle behind this molecular markers detection and molecular markers based on DNA hybridization marker based on PCR amplification then we will discuss random amplified polymorphic DNA remember their full forms their uh, full forms need to be remembered quite essential from examination point of view then AFLP amplified fragment length polymorphism and molecular marker assisted selections I mean this is the topic uh, when we used to teach in college in agriculture college most of our lecturers doesn't want to teach this topic because it's very complex and, it, and difficult to understand and, and, and it, it doesn't strike people for their own you know attraction but to me I felt um, this has been always been hidden and never been uh, like bring out to the audience that these DNA markers they play a very 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 vital role in the field of molecular biology uh, specifically uh, to our crop improvement because agriculture uh, has been a very basic part of our India the main essential part of India uh, the economy but we are still using the most traditional methods from the past and there, there are some national institutes have been developed for the crop improvement but the level of uh, you know production the level of R&D it's still very far behind as compared to all all over the world search is going on so I am in Delhi at the moment so we are having Indian Agriculture Research Institute which is very well very well renowned in the world and many research papers are going on many research is going on there and I have been like uh, going in the evening for cycling so I'm going to that road around the Indian Agriculture Institute it's a very 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 huge complex very huge complex um, but that's the thing in India uh, the government thinks uh, where these researchers uh, they, they invest a lot of money in buying the land and making infrastructure but I, I'm not want to be critical here but what I have seen by myself the the research equipments that we have inside the research the methodology the way we are going it's very very uh, very past I don't want to. I'm very proud Indian. I'm very um, what you say. Yeah, I, I, I'm very patriotic to India because this is the India where I did my tenth class. I gave my CBSC board. This is the place where I my, gave my twelfth class with PCMB, physics, chemistry, maths, biology, and I was given chance to do my biotechnology and everything. But once I saw the outer world, when I cut out of my own well, when I see wow, this is a whole new world then you see that where are you standing uh, we are still uh, quite behind I just want that whosoever the students that are attending my classes in, uh, during this pandemic time um, keep a fire burning in you we want to be uh, like Modi ji has brought this Atam Nirbhar Bharat like we need to be dependent and biotechnology is the thing that has came out to be one of the best uh, you know aspect in upcoming days so keep your spirit high keep your things up and keep continuing yeah so that was my <laughs> something um, far apart from this crop things yeah okay so molecular markers so molecular markers they are the DNA sequence in the genome which can be located and identified um, and as a result of uh, genetic alterations uh, mutations insertions deletions so we can do all these uh, uh, problematic into our things yeah so these differences collectively called polymorphisms can be mapped and identified and plant breeders always prefer to detect the gene as the molecular markers so this was not possible before so the most highly reliable and advantage of using molecular markers in plants breeding programs are they are the molecular marker that quite, quite high uh, truly representations of the genetic makeup at the DNA level. 
and they are the consistent and they are not infected by the environmental factors. And they can be detected um, much by the development of the plants and most of them these markers are generated as we are required as per our needs. So let's see let's assume there are two plants of the same species one is disease sensitivity and other with disease resistance. Yeah, there are two plants. So if there is a DNA marker that can identify these two alleles then can genome be extracted, digested and restriction enzymes. So we need to identify which DNA marker that we are looking for. So the genome can be extracted from them, digested by restriction enzymes and separated by gel electrophoresis. And DNA fragments can be detected by their separations. For instance, I, we having a disease resistance plant which having a shorter DNA fragment and disease sensitive plant which having a longer DNA fragment. So we can differentiate between these two. So for example here, so this is the disease sensitive plant. This is disease sensitive plant and this is disease resistance plant okay so we extracted the in the first step in all these molecular markers we extract our DNA marker uh, DNA extract and then we digest them with the restriction enzymes like restriction endonucleases or HAM3 or um, E. coli 1 like that then we run over the gel electrophoresis <laughs> the one with the disease sensitive plant will have shorter DNA fragment whereas a longer DNA fragment will be from the disease resistance plant. So in this way we can differentiate between these two parts. Yeah, We can differentiate between these two parts. And these molecular markers of two types one is PCR based one is non PCR based. So the PCR based are the PCR amplifications and the and the non pcr based are the dna hybridization based yeah so let's take one by one oops yeah so the molecular markers based on the dna hybridization under this uh, comes your first rflp that is your restriction fragment length polymorphism so rflp was the first technology employed for the detection of polymorphism based on the dna sequence differences so RFLP is mainly based on the altered restriction enzyme sites. So as a result of mutations, recombinations of uh, genomic DNA. An outline of the RFLP analysis is given in uh, how RFLP is done in the next figure. So in basically the same steps are done that we have discussed in the previous slide. That is isolation of genomic DNA. Then we digest them with the restriction enzyme, then separate uh, by electrophoresis then finally we hybridize with the clone or label probes that you're looking for isolate number one DNA pieces separated by electrophoresis then DNA pieces transferred to membrane protein then RFLP bands so like this so in the first method we digest them with the restriction endonucleases, then we incubate with the clone label probes. And some molecular markers are based on DNA hybridization. Some particular example has been shown about the RFLP. So we are having two plants, plant A and plant B. Okay. In the plant, so in the presence of restriction sites, DNA fragments of different lengths can be generated by using different restriction enzymes. So we are having plant A and B. So plant A, uh, a mutation has occurred leading to the loss of the restriction sites. So in the plant A, there is a mutation occurs and it doesn't have any restriction sites it lost it so it could be digested by the uh, your E. coli yeah it will be only be digested by the <coughs> it will not actually um, 
it will not be registered by the E. coli. But in the plant B, there is no uh, mutation happen. So it will be uh, digested by both HIN3 and E. coli. So because of that, once we have HIN3 in that, because it doesn't have that site of restriction, so that has been omitted. So it will give only two fragments, right? One will be of 200 base pair, one will be 800 base pair in the plant A. So in the plant B, you are having a 200 base pairs, a 440, uh, 450 base pairs and 350 base pairs. Yeah. So indeed, we are having a 350 because of E. coli and 650, we can say. So if we see from the perspective of HIN3 enzyme, yeah, from the HIN3 perspective, uh, plant A and plant B, they will give both 200 and 800 base pairs. Whereas on the other side with the E. coli, in the plant A, as it doesn't have, um, you know, restriction sites, it will give me a full 1000 base pair. It will not cut from anywhere but from the other side it will give me one 350 uh, 350 base pairs and 450 plus 200 650 base pairs so i'm getting a polymorphic pattern a different pattern so that's why it's called as restriction fragment length polymorphism we have restricted the fragment and the length polymorphism and we have watched from that restricted length a polymorphism afterwards so that's the um, basic principle behind it uh, that's the basic principle behind it okay that the same thing has been shown with a, a little bit cartoon here you are having a plant source DNA restriction digestion, electrophoretic separation, southern hybridization, then autoradiograph. So molecular based on PCR amplification. So polymerase chain reaction, PCR is a novel technique for the amplification of selected regions of DNA. The advantage with PCR is that even a minute quantity of DNA can be amplified. Thus PCR based moleculars requires only a small quantity of DNA to start with them. So according to the PCR based, so first one we have discussed the RFLP was your DNA hybridization based that is non PCR based now we're going to discuss on the PCR based so according to the PCR based so they are locus non specific markers that is examples are random amplified polymorphic DNA that is RAPD then amplified fragment length polymorphism that is AFLP so local specific markers examples are uh, so these are low non specific and they are so local specific <laughs> for the local specific then there are two types here single nucleotide polymorphism that is SNPs and then simple sequence repeats simple sequence repeats and single nucleotide polymorphism So about uh, random amplified polymorphic DNA RAPD markers. 
So RAPD are the molecular markers based on the PCR amplification. An outline of RAPD is being shown here. So in this, again we isolate the genomic DNA, then we denature with the DNA, denature this DNA. Now comes your PCR stuff here. We anneal them with the primers. Our DNA tamper, the one which is denatured now, we anneal them with the primers. And complementary stand synthesis is done and amplified products by gel electrophoresis are identified further. So single shot oligonucleotide primers, they are usually 10 base primers. Yeah and can arbitrarily selected and used for amplification DNA segments of the genome. And the amplified products are separated on the electrophoresis and identified. So when the DNA molecules are digested by the enzyme HIN3, there is no difference in the DNA fragments that are separated. However, with enzyme E. coli 1, plant A DNA molecule, is not digested while plant B DNA molecule is digested. This results in polymorphic pattern of separation. So the same way what we see the previous example of plant A and B, um, that is the same one but in this we are using PCR amplifications which are annealed with the primers. That's the main difference. That's why it's randomly amplified polymorphic DNA name itself says. So some applications of this, um, so for example, RAPDs are used to distinguish between variety uh, that is based on the differences in the DNA sequence. So like 15 commercial no uh, sunflower varieties has been produced with that, bean varieties has been produced with the RAPD markers uh, and many more. And 296 markers that could be find out also almost 85 percent similarity were predicted with them. So for example, uh, DNA from plant allows the amplifications of sequence A, C, D but not B. A, C, D will be amplified but not B. And in the plant one, Primer sites for the primer use not found at the sequence B. So let's see here. So we are having four different varieties of plants and these are the various sequences that we are able to see. Yeah, A, B, C, D. Yeah, so in the plant one, we are not able to see sequence B. That's what is written by the amplification we were able to see sequence A, C, D, but not B. This indicates that plant one primer sites for the primer use not formed at a sequence B. So the primer that has been added, it is not sequence for the site B, for sure. Similarly, DNA um, alteration one of the primer sites of sequence A has prevented from being amplified when the plant two is used. So from the plant two, A and B sequence, they are not being amplified and they are not being there. So in this way, we can have a different patterns and we can get to know about our results. Also, RAPD markers have been used to identify several disease resistance genes in plants like RP94 gene, which is responsible for resistance to SRAM rust in barley. RAPD markers identified to link to these genes. Similarly, RAPD markers link to the heat smut resistance uh, which have been characterized. Some more applications of the same. Um, now on the base of your DNA marker based RAPD, there is another form is called as amplified fragment length polymorphism that is AFLP. So in this the main thing is that it is a combination of your RFLP and RAPD. Yeah? It is a, it's a combination of both RFLP and RAPD. So ALFLP is based on the principle of generation of DNA fragments using restriction enzymes and oligonucleotide adapters and their amplifications by PCR. 
Thus, this technique combines the usefulness of friction digestions and PCR. So, DNA of the genome is extracted in them. It is subjected to friction digestion by two enzymes, that is, MSC1 and frequent cutter E. coli 1. The cut ends on both sides are then ligated to known sequences of oligonucleotides. So, PCR is also performed as a pre-selection of the fragments in, in this case and then autoradiography is performed to detect the DNA fragments. Uh, so, like here, <coughs> it's the example of amplified fragment length polymorphism that is your AFLP. So, you have a 5 prime end, 3 prime end, 3 prime end and 5 prime end. We are having this DNA molecule. So, this G, A, A, C, C, T, T, G, C, A, T, A, A, T, G, T, A, T, T, A, A. Right. ठीक है. तो next क्या होता है? Um, we add these friction enzymes. So we have the two friction enzymes, E. coli one and MSC one. So the E. coli 1 will cut the left side and the MSL1 will cut the right hand side. Yeah. So they will they will see the patterns they want to cut and they will cut from that part. So the E. coli is a six cutter. It will cut um, you know the six uh, molecules. Whereas the uh, MSC1 it's a four cutter. It will cut only the four molecules. Right. So in this way from the right it's cut it out we, we still have four parts here and in this part also we have four parts remaining and the rest are gone then we ligation is done we we add the linkers into them ligation is done they are increased again and pre-selective amplifications employing single nucleotide extension so single nucleotide will start to extend like for ctt g <coughs> we will have to have a a c like this and at the bottom c a t so in this way we having um, like what we can say the sequences found in this amplified regions are colored indicating the linkers. So these are the linkers we have added. So right hand mm. side it's showing the um, yeah what do you say the cartoon picture of the same diagrammatic uh, the, the, the mechanism mm. that we have seen on the left hand side. There is isolated plant DNA then we restrict with the fragments. Then after the restriction, there is a link adapters. Yeah. Then after the li uh, ligate adapters, they will ligate your uh, separated part, and then they add non-specific primers and perform PCRs. And you will have electrophoresis in order to visualize your samples. So F AFLP is primarily used in genetic mapping. Several economic important cereal crops such as rice, barley and wheat have been mapped by AFLP. So the AFLP markers which are produced by different combinations of friction enzymes are distributed throughout the genome. So in barley AFLP markers are located on the long and short term for all seven chromosomes. So some examples uh, of these markers per chromosomes, uh, they have a strong relation with the length of a chromosome. For example, in rice, there is a cross between Indica and Yaponica, which leaves, uh, which revealed around 50 AFLP markers. Some more examples of AFLP, for example, 157 RFLP um, markers have been identified and they have increased to by adding 118 AFLP markers in your barley mapping. So there is a KVK, you know, in, in India, we are having a lot of KVKs. And very big research is going. If somebody is doing plant biotechnology, something to uh, to deal with with them. So there is a very big research is going on. I have one contact on my uh, LinkedIn. He's a he's a doctor, PhD in plant physiology itself. <clears throat> Do contact him if you want to have any question uh, regarding. He has a very vast knowledge, very good contact. Uh, whenever I write him on his uh, LinkedIn message, he instantly reply me. He instantly reply me, and very, uh, very nice, <coughs> very humble person. 
I forgot the name. Maybe there in my chat box. Now, nah, maybe later I can share that contact. So, because he's sharing all these markers data in reality that are being used in India at the moment. So, merits that they are have very last keen number of polymorphism is done and map based cloning could be possible. Uh, we can screen pools of plasmid DNA from several clones, enabling uh, rapid isolations of genes tightly linked to the markers. And AFLP has recently been applied to the analysis of quantitative traits in barley and rice also. And AFLP can be used to score semi-dominant markers. This was possible due to the development of new software for image analysis of fluorescent PCR products, which are developed by uh, Key Genes. It's a company Key Gene, which are mainly working in the plant field. So now comes the marker based another part that is marker based on your PCR amplification that is your STS markers, your sequence tag site markers. I hope streaming is going fine. Yeah. So STS markers, they are the sequence tag sites which represent unique simple copy fragments of genomes whose DNA sequences are known and which can be amplified. So by using PCR. So STS markers are used on the polymorphism of simple nucleotide repeats and on the genome and STS have been recently developed in plants. So when the STS loci contains simple sequence length polymorphism, they are highly valuable as molecular markers. STS loci have been analyzed and studied number of plant species. So also microsatellites, uh, they are the tandemly repeated multiple copies of mono, diatri, tetra, nucleotide motifs. And on the sequence characterized amplified regions, they are quite important scars. They are actually the modified version of your STS and they are developed by PCR primers that are made up of the ends of RAPD fragments. And STS converted RAPD markers are sometimes referred to scars and they are useful for the rapid development of STS markers. So how the scars looks like, so these are sequence characterized amplified regions. They are the modified form of STS markers and they are developed by PCR primers that are made up of ends of RAPD fragments. So the STS converted RAPD markers are sometimes referred to scars and scars are useful for rapid development of STS markers. Then this, uh, this is totally different part, uh, molecular marker assisted selection, mass, mass selection that is. Because when we are doing um, molecular marker assisted selection, we want to identify various traits in our plant. So like pathogen and insect resistance, abiotic stress tolerance and various other qualitative and quantitative traits. So in order to do that, your molecular marker assisted selections uh, plays out a, a good role in that. Then molecular breeding, this is very common method um, which helps with the help of genetic engineering in order to produce a good variety of your crops in order to have better yield and quality and to have uh, better cereal production. This has been used during the green revolution time but at the moment they are taking a lot of time to grow but still uh, I had some work experience while working. You know after doing my PhD I used to work uh, small jobs so I used to work in the, in the field. Uh, in order to cut the crop, the plant breeders uh, crops. So the plant breeders have grown their fields, uh, the scientists, so our work was as a worker to <laughs> work in the field, <laughs> we, as a farmer. So I worked for two months in the very hot uh, summer time during the, yeah, and uh, it's a lot of work there, it's a lot of work, believe me. 
then linkage analysis yeah these don't think that this work of molecular breeding that what I have, I have, I have shown you about AFLP and all these things it's very easy because you have to grow them in the field and you have to check your results how the things are and you have to go in the in the most scorching heat uh, in the afternoon and stay there for a couple of hours and maybe for every day you have to work there in the field so it's not just uh, sit on your computer you're doing your work going in the wet lab uh, it's a lot of hard work behind behind this uh, this field believe me lot of then there's a uh, quantitative trait look high QTL so these are the main characteristics that are controlled by several genes in complex manners so some examples are like growth uh, growth habit yield adaptability to environment disease resistance all are these these are being taken care so they improve the complex character controlled by many genes and it is not an easy job to manipulate uh, multiple genes in genetic engineering. For instance, uh, development of golden rice involving the assertion of just three genes took about seven years. So, thank you very much. So, this was the part of the DNA based markers where we have discussed in details about RFLP, AFLP, RAPD, SSRs. okay now uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes 30 minutes let's continue with dna fingerprinting so that's uh, totally totally different so uh, anyone have you watched this movie uh, i want to go off topic now a little bit but it's good to go off topic i think sometimes you know Matrix. It's a trilogy series, you know. I uh, recently was going through my Netflix, and uh, I never had a time actually to watch any movie. But uh, last night I I started the first part at nine o'clock, and then I keep watching the all series, and I stop by five a.m. in the morning, and I have cl college in the morning, online classes from nine. It was a bad thing what I did. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this movie, um, it's not about sci uh, like fighting Kung Fu and all this. Th this movie has a quite a deeper meaning uh, at the end of the life. You know, it, it just explain what his dream is, what his life is, who we are, uh, what our variables are. Are we a good variable or bad variable? Why are we here on this earth? Are we here? Are we like an equation making left hand side and right hand side to be... Uh, equal LHS equal to RHS. Um, what is what is what is the uh, are we are, are the are the one in the good in some eyes and we are bad in this in some eyes. Yeah. So who defines who is good and bad? What defines what is good and bad? What is karma? So the the things that we have in our Indian um, you know tradition about karma and all these. Um, that we are we are told that there's a religion we have to live like that but in this movie they have have taught the same thing in more um, um, what can I say a more realistic way so it, it's 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 a sci-fi movie you know? it's a, it's more about being scientific 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 thing because being a scientist because I, I just remember from Matrix because of this color that it's all movie was about this color there was a fight between machine and human beings. Human beings have created machines and these machines were against us and they grow grow a lot. The same traditional movie but it has a very deeper movie uh, meaning in that movie. Just if you have a time, um, go for this. Okay, so... So now DNA, why we do DNA fingerprinting? It's basically um, to bring out the justice, uh, FBI, is up, up in India, CBI, we are having a forensic development. Uh, if somebody do a crime scene, right? If they do a crime scene and we have to identify the who, who have done the crime. So with the help of DNA finger, fingerprinting, we can find the, the person who is a suspect and the, and the samples that we have got on from the, um, from the crime scene. So we can confirm from both DNA. 
that how things are working. So that's the basic concept behind it. So why use DNA fingerprinting? It's a basically to tell the individuals of same species apart and DNA sequences are variables and can therefore be used as identifying characteristics. So they are the DNA fingerprinting has advantages over the other sources of evidence like high highly accurate can be gathered from trace crime scene evidence. And how do you take DNA fragments? So you can do it with the help of uh, as we have discussed that's why first in this in, in this lecture series I started with the restriction enzymes we have understood what are restriction enzymes what are its various types then I took you to the uh, various types of DNA molecule markers and now I took you to the application of these RFLP markers and restriction enzymes so that everything uh, makes a sense at the end uh, together that why we are studying and 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 having a very nice uh, flow of the story. So in this case, your RFLP that we have just discussed, um, they play a big role. So we, the same way, we cut our DNA into pieces and each enzyme cut a specific DNA part and then we get a small number of fragments and because of these small number of fragments, all human beings have a different DNA fingerprinting and based on that, we can detect the things. So in, let's say we having uh, this our DNA, right? And this is a restriction enzyme scheme, BAM H1. So it started to cut it. Then you have sticky ends at the end. So let's say one is individual end, individual one, and it could cut from the four paths. It could cut from the four paths and leading to production of five fragments A, B, C, D, E. Then there is an individual 2 and which will give 4 fragments that is A, B, C, D. So there is individual 1 and individual 2. So individual 1 giving 5 fragments, individual 2 giving 4 fragments. So for sure these two people are different and they will give different DNA fingerprinting at the end. So in summary what we have discussed now that every DNA when they cut by the enzymes they will have various sizes and each individual bending pattern should be different because restriction enzymes will cut each person DNA at different points and fragments of different sizes will travel different distances along a gel uh, when an electric current is passed through it. Then agros gel electrophoresis. Then agrose gel electrophoresis, here we have done um, different bending patterns from different individuals, right? So this, this is 2, this is 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. So in this way we are having uh, every fragment, every person is having different. This is the molecular markers and everyone is showing different markers. Yeah, no one is similar to each other. So DNA fingerprinting and forensic analysis. So... <coughs> So how this thing could be used from the forensic point of view? So introduction to DNA fingerprinting and forensics. Just a second student. So introduction to DNA fingerprinting and forensics. So forensic science can be uh, defined as intersection of law and sciences. So first photography, then fingerprint, then in 1985, uh, uh, DNA fingerprinting has been identified. So DNA fragments show unique patterns from one person to the next used in paternity disputes and as forensic evidence. So preparing a DNA fingerprint. So specimen collection should be licked envelope 
and dirty laundry cigarette butts so we can check with these different things and we need to be very careful while doing that so our gloves disposable instruments avoid talking sneezing avoid touching samples with your skin air dry the evidence before packaging so mold does not grow in them so enemies of uh, evidence sunlight high temperature bacteria moisture are used so idle is 1 ml of fresh whole blood treated with the edta so this is the same uh, rflp has been shown individual one uh, has is been cut it out two places giving rise to three and individual two is cut it out giving rise to two uh, things so rflp fragments can be separated by gel electrophoresis so like in individual one we will see three different patterns in individual two we will see two different patterns because of uh, cutting at different point so different stuff i don't know what is this maybe a virus let's check the virus restriction enzymes recognize restriction sites and no nah, it's not working it's fake anyhow so then molecular technique where then dna is then whatever the results that we got then is transfer to the uh, southern uh, blotting over the gel in order to identify the further uh, your results so in the southern blotting uh, first you prepare your genomic dna and then run over the agrose gel and after running over the agrose gel we transfer your sample over the nylon membrane now after transferring on the nylon membrane the next step, step is to hybridize a radioactive labeled dna probe with the specific sequences on the membrane so your membrane with the dna bands transferred to it and labeled probe incubated with the membrane <clears throat> the last step is to expose with the radioactive labeled membrane in order to find out the your labeled pro pro proton oh ho nothing is working in this world Th then then vntrs they are the variable uh, number tandem repeats so like they are the sequences which are repeated again and again in this case five times and this time two times and it is uh, varied from person to person it's different from person to person um so if the five repeats are there you will see band to be on higher level if it is two bands two repeats then at the lower level so this is how we can differentiate between different individual also and this is a pcr lab technique to amplify your dna fragments um so we have discussed this in our first lecture i will not repeat this where you have to dna to be amplified primers are there dna polymerase is there nucleotides are there pcr reaction is done you sample your heat your sample at 94 degrees celsius then anneal them at 50 and 60 degrees celsius then maintain temperature at 72 degrees celsius for a minute then thermal cycler repeat the, these cycles for 30 times 94 55 72 so pcr amplification is logarithmic meaning the number of copies of the target is doubled every cycle maybe this will work so nothing is going to work today and uh, that's no worries uh, it's also help in uh, this uh, dna fingerprinting in diagnosis diseases and pedigree analysis paternity testing in forensic yeah as we have discussed maybe this should work these things that i'm facing problem it's because i'm using mac uh, computer and if i if you can try in your case uh, i will share this link with you just try all these and try these mcqs also it will be nice
so there is a crime scene yeah so on november 1st approximately at 8 8 15 pm so jimmy sweet enter his bedroom and walk over to his desk and sat at his computer so while reaching for the computer switch he noticed out of the corner of his eye that one of the items typically well organized shelf was out of place then jimmy shot across the room for closer examination and indeed it was disturbed and the object has been sealed in airtight package and the package is now ripped open the object was still inside but it was no longer in original conditions in jimmy's eyes it was now worthless so jimmy pulled out what it has been most valued possession his holographic nova lollipop so it was a lollipop for jimmy which was lying over the desk and he saw that it was open and it has been licked by someone and it was sticky and it could not be used again so someone had obviously indulged, uh, indulged him or herself in its uh, sugary molecules so lollipop uh, holographic image had been licked away so they these are the very quiet uh, very innocent um, suspects which might be the reason so these are all jimmy seven sisters candy cookie sugar lolly honey brandy and carmela so all of these sweet uh, sisters of uh, jimmy uh, are the notorious candy lover and they could be the uh, they could be one of the suspect uh, in this crime and the suspects have been detained and dna fragments of each are available so we need to go to the nova lab chief technician and we need to give the lollipop and we also need saliva from all these um, uh, ladies and in order to find out the crime who was the one who licked that lollipop yeah funny yeah <laughs> just be there whosoever here yeah, till now so in this first we add friction enzyme to our dna samples so friction enzymes to our dna sample then we pour a gross gel into the lab counter this is a gross gel we pour it here okay now pour dna into tray now we will pour dna into the tray now let's turn on the power button to begin the electrophoresis so our dna is moving 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 then we place our nylon membrane top in order to transfer this dna um, fragments over the nylon membrane now add probes to the nylon membrane in the tray so dna probes so so we have added these probes so we have just probes to the nylon membrane these probes are actually the pieces of dna that have been radioactively labeled so that the probes attach themselves to the dna fragment on the nylon membrane and they attach only where the code and coordinate certain sequence of code among the various fragments so excess probes all of the material that had not attached to the dna was washed away so they will be attached only the specific portion now uh, put x-ray film on top of the membrane we put this x-ray membrane now we will um, develop this film by dragging into the developer we put this into the developer now choose the culprit so this is the saliva uh, of the culprit yeah and these are the various dna fragments that we got from the girls so which one do you think would be the reason which one uh, seems same tell me in the chat box tell me in the chat box uh, is it candy cookie sugar lolly honey brandy or caramela which one of these ladies is doing that So the, uh, we can maybe see from these three big patterns. This one is big. This one is big. This one is big. So where can we see these three big patterns somewhere? I think honey. Is it honey? 
Who is it? Honey. Is it honey or who won? Yes, it's honey. Honey is the culprit. She was the one who have taken that lollipop and <laughs> tasted it back. So this is how DNA fingerprinting works and we find the um, like we can check it and put it over that and yes it's it's somehow same no it's not or yeah we have correctly determined and she's sad now thank you to the nova lab who has solved this case so now you are all certified forensic uh, scientist so wherever you see a crime scene in your nearby you you are already a professional go to your lab and you can find out the culprit and tell that yes yes you are the one you did it <laughs> like in the in the film in the sony tv we are seeing from day and night uh <laughs> Savdhan, india so so we are all now certified forensic scientists cool na in a single day wish i could give you that certificate but no I, it's not possible <laughs> uh, something with genealogy that is your um, what do you say the migration of uh, people from one place to another uh, we can tell from the genetic uh, perspective uh, how things have been have been traveled is this working because some of the things they they stop working with the time no it's not so thank you very much. That's the end of the show of today. Um, I hope you have learned a bit from it, from RFLP markers and DNA fingerprinting. And thank you very much for being there and adjusting with me today. I will, I will uh, make sure that tomorrow is, this class will be at 7. So tomorrow we will start with a very interesting topics that is um, protein, protein isolation and purification. There will be a lot of uh, labs uh, cases in that. Uh, it's an interesting one. You will like it. So we will go for, uh, we will also have class on Saturday then, Friday, Saturday and we will continue like that. Nice. Okay then. Take care. Bye bye. Ciao. Good night. Sleep well. Stay safe.